Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I'm excited today. We have Dr. Simeon Hine, the author of Opening Minds, A Journey of Extraordinary Encounters, Crop Circles and Resonance, also the author of Planetary Intelligence, 101 Easy Steps to Energy, Well-Being and Natural Insight. Dr. Hine is the founder of the Mount Baldy Institute for Resonance in Colorado. He teaches remote viewing. He is also doing crop circle tours for those of you that are interested in that in July in England. We welcome you to its rainmaking time. Thank you for being here to discuss resonance and bringing this subject into a clear frame of reference for the public. Thank you, Dr. Hines. Well, thanks for having me here today, Kim. I think the first thing that really struck me in your book was that we're conscious of one-tenth of one percent of the information that comes in every second. You say 16 out of 40 million bits. That's and right. And I wonder if you could speak to that to just begin to open the field for people about this. Right. Well, this is based on, uh, you know, the work of the Danish science writer Tor Norotrander. So there have been a lot of studies in human, you know, cognition and brain physiology and what the researchers have found really surprisingly is that we're not really conscious as much as we think we are it's an illusion because most of what the information that comes into our awareness every second is deleted by the subconscious mind and the conscious mind too so all we're left with everything you see around you and hear and are perceiving right now is just a tiny fraction of a thousandth of a percent of all the information that's available to you which means we're basically, like Tony Robbins used to say, we're deletion creatures. <laughs> he didn't know how right he was. <laughs> why do you think it is that way, and why do you think that's where we operate from? Do you think it's like a natural thing that we're built that way, we were arranged that way, we were born into the world that way? Well, well, it does have to do with the way nature designed us, which is pretty much, it's not that long ago that we were like animals in the forest, you know? And when you're living in a survival-based situation where things can change in a split second you pretty much need to focus on just what's important at the moment. And so nature designed us to just focus on our physical senses mostly because the fight or flight response and basically what you need to survive <clears throat> on the savanna or in the plains or wherever you're living. But now we're obviously as a advanced civilization or like some of us would like to believe we're an advanced civilization. You wouldn't always believe that if you look what we do every day. but. Where we are now is we're not in that fight or flight situation all the time. We're not constantly in a survival situation. So there's more opportunities to make more use of the information that's available to us in terms of subtle energy and resonance and so forth. But it just basically, because of survival, we're physiologically designed to throw away information that isn't necessary. But there's another aspect to it, Kim, which is very interesting. Uh, and it's something that I mentioned in Opening Minds. It's that society trains us from a very young age to decide what is real and what isn't real. And so by a very young age, because of what we've been taught around us, we're kind of hardwired to see certain things as real as certain things as not real. Uh, these studies were done at Harvard with, with kittens, and uh, they found that kittens raised in a room just with vertical stripes can never see horizontal objects again. That's fascinating, and I, and and I love that in your versa. book. Yeah, so there's a there's a certain processes that nature built into us, and there's also physiological processes from our perceptual conditioning when we're very young to f delete things that don't, we don't think are real. Now, the, the, the thing about this is by the time we're a certain age, right, just a few years old, from a variety of these processes, what we think is real is kind of hardwired into us, and we can never really see anything outside those boundaries again unless we have some sort of training to really expand our, you know, lens and our, our, our veil of perception. I loved your fascinating example in the book where you showed that the indigenous peoples during times of Columbus and other explorers didn't see the ships coming in because they weren't wired to accept ships as a reality. Talk to that for a moment. It's, this is an example of what you're talking about, too. Yes, that's a, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. You know, we always like to believe that we're somehow more advanced than those people hundreds of years ago that the European explorers encountered. But we react the same way they did to the ships of the explorers, Magellan and all the others. They all reported this to some extent or another, which was that when they would show up, they would kind of keep their boat 
anchored out in a bay somewhere off the coast, and they would go in with rowboats or canoes, something like that. And the indigenous peoples couldn't see the ship. They, they would see like what they thought was like a mountain out on the water, but they couldn't make sense of it. And it was usually the medicine man who had some training to go beyond the narrow perceptual boundaries that the tribe had grown up with, who could see it first for what it was and, and gradually over a period of a couple of days explain what it was to his uh, comrades. You know, and we're the same way. If you think of all the phenomena that we see around us, people take pictures of things and then they say, I don't remember seeing that when I took the picture. I, I think you know what I'm referring to. There's yes. so many pictures like that and experiences. So we have to think, well, if we're like the indigenous peoples compared to the explorers and we're being approached now, if this is happening by other visitors, then we're really not going to see it for what it is really either. We're going to have our own uh, kind of story imposed on whatever's really happening out there because it takes a while to reorient your perception if it's if it even happens at all you speak in the book about this new paradigm this multi-dimensional resonance i want you to explain this to the public because to the extent all of us don't get this we miss everything from that point forward can you explain it yeah that's exactly right kim that's the real point our science has based been based on a certain mechanistic paradigm you know, we're all familiar with this paradigm. It looks at things and nature and the world around us as if it's a machine made up of parts that interact in a very linear, predictable way. You know, this, this paradigm has invaded biology and medicine, even ecology, and for a long time, physics. <clears throat> and it became so successful because it worked very well at the level that it was designed to work at. <clears throat> I mean, if you're sending someone to the moon or something, that paradigm still works very well because it describes how physical objects move in a gravitational field. But if you're talking about the more complex interactions of biological and living things, that paradigm completely breaks down and it actually causes a lot of damage. You can see some of the effect on this type of thinking on some of the ideas that we now ridicule in medicine about what they used to, people, doctors used to believe made people sick. You know, it was an wasn't even until very recently that people even realized that bacteria caused infections or uh, that, you know, uh, we were affected by our environment. It used to be believed that, you know, there were these four different levels of humors in the body, liquids, and if they got out of balance, that's what made you sick. And that's what led to the introduction of bleeding or even the uh, use of putting mercury into people's bodies, for heaven's sake, <laughs> to make them better. These we now all see as superstitions. But at the time, they were seen as the height of, you know, medical, the height of medical knowledge. And so this idea of seeing the human body as just a mechanical system that had to be balanced out like a machine really caused a lot of damage. And there are some estimates that say that until about 100 years ago, medicine killed more people than it saved. And there are even studies now that show that millions of people have still died in about a 15-year period from iatrogenic diseases, you know, diseases that people get in hospitals or... Uh, you mean like staff or something like that that travels through the hospitals? Exactly. Okay. And that is a direct, you say, well, how does that relate? It's a direct result of the mechanistic paradigm of the idea of using antibiotics and antibacterial soaps, which we now know, it's sure, it kills a lot of the bacteria, but the ones that survive now have no competition. And they're the meanest, baddest ones on the block. So you've just basically multiplied them. MRSA is a good example of this. You know this flesh-eating yes. Uh, yes, uh, bacteria. There's lots of examples like that, uh, tuberculosis and other types of diseases, now that no antibiotics, were, in some cases, in some countries, there are no antibiotics that work against them anymore because the antibiotics have been used so indiscriminately. In other words, our idea that you have these magic uh, bullets that can just kill all the bad bacteria is a very mechanistic idea way of looking at it. You know how, how the mo latest idea thinking about this is that antibiotics are part of nature, but they're not used. Organisms use antibiotics to communicate with their neighbors in the soil. Can you believe this? No, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yes. It, they're, they're, it's a communication system to gradually and, and carefully communicate with your neighbors. It's not there to be used indiscriminately just to, to kill everything off because in the soil, in ecosystems, it's a system of thousands of types of organisms that need to learn to live together. And if you wipe out one of them indiscriminately, something's going to take its place. Uh, I know I'm going on and on about this, but it's important. Uh, 
our, our skin is covered with hundreds of different types of bacteria. And if you kill some of them off, like with antibacterial soaps or something like that, then the, the, the ones that are not as friendly to you are going to start taking over. So it's more like a balanced system yes. where you need all of the components. And our limited, narrow-minded thinking has led us to believe that we are intelligent to know which ones we can kill off and which ones we shouldn't, which is causing lots and lots of problems. So anyway, that's just one example of how the mechanistic paradigm has kind of led us astray. And we've used all these kind of magic bullets and these kind of neutron bomb techniques to improve our health. But in the long run, it doesn't work because nature adapts, the bacteria adapts. So what we're learning is that things are systems. And when you deal with systems, you need a system-wide approach. You can't look at it indiscriminately and say, I'm just going to keep this and get rid of that and keep this. It doesn't work that way. Speaking yeah, of that, Dr. Hines, I have a business organization called the Rainmaking Company. Yes. And I provide a whole systems approach to opportunity sharing, to deal making, to financing, to raising financing, to marketing, to communication. In consultation, all these other areas are never left out just because somebody wants to bring their product to market or raise funds or have a communication strategy that works for them. The whole systems approach is really lacking in the public mind and understanding. And that's also why I feel like your book is critical, plus also DHOC's book on chaotic or chaos organizations. But I want you to go back and I want you to lay out the framework for the public on what is resonance and how does it distinguish itself from frequency or non-locality. Right. So in contrast to this more mechanistic way of looking at things just at the surface, um, the resonant paradigm looks at things more in terms of vibration and frequency and resonance. So the idea is basically the example I used in Opening Minds is that like two tuning forks, you know, if they're tuned to the same frequency and you hit one, the other one will start ringing spontaneously. Yes. And that's kind of like a very simple example of a non-local interaction. In other words, because they are, um, because they're vibrating at the same frequency, they automatically interact. I need to go a little deeper into this so we are actually on the same page with the public. What do you mean by vibrating at the same frequency? Well, you know, the best example of that would be just uh, a radio station yes. or radio waves or even how we're talking on the phone right now at a distance. Correct. Uh, this is we're aware that all of the radio waves in the world are around us all the time, but you won't perceive them unless you have the right uh, receiver. Tuning. Correct. You know, like uh, like your cell phone. You know there's a lot of other people talking on the cell phone, but you're on your own frequency for that moment. It's just you and your guest. So um, in the same way that all the signals are around us all the time, you're only receiving what frequency your particular biological subtle energy system is working on you, your thoughts, your biology, all of it together. And uh, in other words... Rather than looking at it like you have to initiate the interaction, the resonant paradigm sees things as a more complete system where everything is kind of all happening at once, but you just get that frequency that you're on at the time, which creates the reality that you're perceiving. So basically, instead of going out there to change the world, you more focus on changing your own particular frequency, just like you tune to a different channel on the TV. Is that where you explain in the book under the time section that your body is like a signal processor, an etheric machine? Is that an example of that? Yeah, because a lot of the research is showing increasingly that our cells even communicate this way. Uh, the mechanistic way of looking at our body would be, well, the cells communicate, you know, through these different chemical messengers and so forth. It's still a very direct physical process. But a lot of the research inc increasingly shows that even cells that are next to each other communicate through frequency. And just an example of that, there's uh, the work of uh, Fritz Popp in Germany who showed that cells communicate through light. They did these interesting studies where they took similar cells and they separated them by glass and then they coated the glass over with a black paint or darkened it. And they found that uh, there was a difference in the way the cells grew if there, there was light coming through the glass, if there, if there wasn't, between a just very thin plate of glass, which suggested that the cells are communicating to each other in some way that, you know, we can't easily explain. 
but it's not happening through chemicals. It's happening through light. You explain also in the book that matter that has to do with blips of energy and light, the whole idea of time and space, and what appears to be solid is not. You say that the state of quantum fields is affected by those who observe them and can take on the form of a wave or a particle, depending on the situation. So basically, our belief structures are really telling us what's real and what's not real. But what do you mean when you say the quantum fields are affected by those who observe them and can take on the form of a wave or a particle? What does that mean? Well, that is another really important component of this whole discussion. It's because the paradigm, the Newtonian Cartesian paradigm, the mechanistic paradigm, sees objects you know, as being solid, right? As physically there. And the weird thing about quantum mechanics, uh, which has not really been disproved yet in any way, is that it doesn't seem that there is anything there because if you look at the subatomic level, subatomic particles are mostly empty space. In other words, everything you see around you, things you can touch and see and hear, those are not really physical objects. They're, if you look at the amount of space in there compared to the particles themselves in, a, in like a molecule, for example, they are proportionally as empty as intergalactic space. And even if you can find the actual particle itself, uh, you know, a neutrino or electron or all the different types of particles that exist in quantum mechanics, yeah. There's still just blips of energy blinking on and off in this big vacuum. So what quantum mechanics tells us is that solid objects are like 99.99999% empty space with a little bit of energy there that give the illusion of solidity. And when you put your hand against something and it feels solid, it's just because the electron orbital shells are bumping up against each other. It's not that there's anything really touching. Absolutely fascinating. So basically, we're tuning in such little amounts of what's occurring that even our sense of reality is impaired just being human. Could we say that? Yeah, it really is. If you think of all the possibilities of what this energy system can be, it's really reduced down just to a tiny little shadow of what it really is. And what reduces it down, obviously, is our belief systems about what we think is there. Now, I noticed that you spoke on page 33 in your book, opening minds about fractals, that right. they're self-regulating and self-organized. Talk about why you mentioned fractals and what does fractals have to do with resonance and what does it have to do with remote sensing or remote viewing? Well, that's really interesting because the type of mathematics that I grew up with in graduate school was still based on this linear idea with a certain sense of predictability and the idea that you could control things if you could figure out the mathematical equations. And what fractal geometry shows us is that nature isn't really based on lines. It's based on these kind of fractured uh, patterns of shapes that are based on branching structures, right? You can see this clearly in you know, the way your hair looks and trees and lots of things, clouds. They're continually breaking off into smaller and smaller pieces. Like, think of your bronchial system in your lungs, you know? Okay. It keeps branching off into smaller and smaller uh, little uh, uh, tubules in your lungs so that they can interact with the capillaries for maximum oxygen transfer. So the way nature designs systems for maximum flow-through is not to design one really big thing that works in a very predictable way, but it's designed lots of branching structures so that it's very resilient, right? Okay. And that, so there's lots of surface area. So basically what mathematicians discovered, they actually discovered this a long time ago, Kim, but they were really afraid of fractals because they called them like mathematical monsters. <laughs> they weren't easy to understand. And then the work of different mathematicians showed that things like signal line noise in a telephone line kind of behaved like this. And now they're finding that even weather patterns are much more model you can model them much better if you look at them like a fractal than if you look at them as a linear system they're used in like uh, compression algorithms for jpeg pictures and satellite compression so they found a lot of use for these things but basically the idea is that nature really is not built around lines lines exist in our minds <laughs> when you look on the beach you don't see lots of lines you see a coastline from a distance but if you get very close you see lots of increasingly grains of sand right 
So yes. it's very disorderly. Well, here's the, the take-home message from all this. Fractal systems, like the way nature is designed, have chaotic dynamics, right? Correct. Not linear dynamics, and they're based more on chaos than linear, which means that little changes can have big effects, right? Correct. It's not just that big changes have big effects and little changes have little effects. Little things in the right circumstances can have big effects. And that means things are a lot less predictable than we thought. I think we found this out very convincingly with the recent financial uh, kind of situations we had in the markets and Wall Street and so forth with the types of products that they were investing in is that they were a lot less predictable than anybody thought. They were using the wrong models. <laughs> yes, indeed. And yes, little changes can percolate throughout the system and all of a sudden the whole thing is going into free fall and needs a government bailout. That's a kind of perfect example of chaos theory. We've been living under this illusion for a long time that things are orderly and predictable, linear, and chaos theory says real-world systems don't exist like that. And just one last thing that's important about it, the more tightly coupled systems become with our technology, yes. the more chaotic they become too. And things can happen in ways that you never expect. So we're actually inviting more and more chaos in the more we couple systems tightly together. It could be financial systems, it could be the way our cars are designed, whatever. You're going to get increasingly unpredictable effects. The interesting thing about chaos, though, Dr. Hines, is that chaos can be prepared for, meaning you can engender and support what Dehawk called chaotic systems, meaning you prepare systems and structures that anticipate and are built for chaos because chaos is really the norm. We just haven't accepted it. And through that, you can have order. But when you force an order and you force structure that does not allow for chaos, you actually get chaos. He built Visa based on chaos theory. Anyway, he has a whole book about it and how he built Visa. And it was very interesting. You speak in the book about the butterfly effect, how you can have a little bitty change, but it affects something across the world. Can you explain how you know about the butterfly effect? Well, right. You're raising a lot of good points there. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The butterfly effect is the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings over the Amazon rainforest could affect the weather over in Africa or Europe because a slight change can lead to all sorts of effects. And that's been found, uh, by the way, it's really been found to be true in weather systems in prediction. They find just a, a tiny little fluctuation over the smallest area can percolate throughout the whole system. And so basically, but what you're saying is a very important point is that when we build systems for predictability, we inevitably create something in the long run that's going to go chaotic and become unpredictable. And if we build them for resiliency and let there be a certain amount of change to naturally occur in the system, yeah. it'll be more stable in the long run. So and more creative, really too. <laughs> more creative and more evolutionary. So it's a real question of where you want your stability. Do you want it from second to second? If that's important to you, then you're going to have long-term disorder. Or are you more concerned with long-term stability, which in that case you need to allow more short-term disorder, right? Yes. And, I, I mean, a good example of that is what happened to the former Soviet Union. You know, I mean, they didn't allow any change at all in their system, right? right. And at the end of it, we had Gorbachev trying to introduce reforms desperately so that the system could evolve and grow, but it was too late. The system had already become too uh, rigid and sclerotic, and it just fell apart. The whole East, Eastern, Euro Eastern European uh, system with uh, the Soviet Union kind of being at the lead of that just completely fell apart. So uh, that's a kind of an example of a brittle structure, right? Because it can't evolve. So systems that seem to survive into the longer term allow a lot more chaos in the short term. They, you're talking about... The Visa, another good example, is the way the whole Internet's designed, right? If yes. one node goes down, it's designed, you know, it's really actually designed by the military originally, and they kind of understand these things, ironically, much better than a lot of the academic communities. It's kind of surprising, but if you build these systems that are very resilient, you need to have a lot of flexibility in there, but you lose a lot of control, which is a real benefit to us now, right? Because the Internet cannot easily be controlled anymore at all, and that's why things are going to evolve in a good way, because there's more chaos. Marquez. You write in the book about 
a few other things I really want to go through in deeply with you. One is the power of the subconscious mind. Now, many of us have heard this, but this is the basis by which remote viewing, correct me if I'm incorrect, remote sensing is accessing the material of the universe or whatever is available in non-locality. The subconscious mind, you say, is the hidden intelligence working through the human being is through the subconscious mind. So what is the subconscious mind other than what we're calling it? What is it that you're referring to? Well, it's a, really, it's a whole system of processes that thinks, but because of what we were talking about earlier in the show, your awareness has decided that you don't need to be listening in on it all the time. And so you get indications that it's there from time to time, from gut feelings and intuitions and so forth. But you're actually not tracking it. It's something that's happening below the surface. Now, just to give an example of what the subconscious is, uh, yes. a digestion is something that's happening subconsciously. Very important process. We can't live for a couple of days without it. But Now, isn't it autonomically happening? Uh, it's, it is and it isn't. I mean, it is uh, happening autonomically, but it's certainly affected by your moods, right? Have you ever really yes, gotten absolutely. to a situation absolutely. where your moods affected your digestion? So it is affected by your thoughts and your feelings and so forth, and that is related to our subconscious. Uh, another example, even easier to understand, uh, breathing. Now, you can consciously control your breath, right? Correct. But if you forget about it, who takes over? <laughs> your subconscious mind. So... It's a whole area of processes where, you know, what remote viewers call it, you might have heard this before from your other interviewees, the limin, where the word subliminal comes from. Talk There's about this it. threshold of awareness, and below that threshold, you're not consciously aware of what's going on. And just to give you an example of that, there's plenty around you that's below the limit of your consciousness, even in your body. If you just stop and pay attention to, like, your uh, left big toe, right? You can check in on how it's doing, but before we started talking about that, you weren't paying attention to it, probably, right? Correct. So that's an example. There are all these processes where your mind can focus like a spotlight onto different aspects of your awareness, but usually they're on autopilot. So there's several different types of subconscious processes. I mean, body regulation is one type of subconscious process. And there's also feelings and intuitions and learned types of subconscious beliefs that we have in us uh, that uh, we're not aware of. There are a lot of studies that have been done about this. I always like to mention that book by Guy Claxton, Hair, Brain, Tortoise, Mind, How Intelligence Increases When You Think Less. Basically, the point of this is That's that That's fascinating. Can, Absolutely fascinating. Say it again. <laughs> Intelligence... Yeah, this is, this is a must-read book. I have no commercial interest in it at all. It's Go ahead. Say, say the name of the book and then Hair, say... Hair, it's by a, a physiologist in Britain. Uh, uh, it's a cognitive uh, physiologist. I think that's what you would call him, or a cognitive uh, psychologist. Guy Claxton, Hair, Brain, Tortoise, Mind, How Intelligence Increases When You Think Less. And it basically shows study after study that show you often do a better job at what you're doing when you don't think about it so much. How about that? <laughs> because that. you're interfering with your subconscious thinking processes. And a lot of studies show that you actually know a lot more than you think you know. But once you start thinking about it consciously, you start interfering. Some of these processes work much better. Remote viewing, obviously, is a good example. But just everyday life when you rely on your feelings about things under certain circumstances, but then when you go with your logical thinking, I'm not trying to put down logical thinking. It's a very powerful tool, but there's a lot, of, you know, what a good example of this is they found that in police lineups, that if they ask you to identify somebody you saw at a crime scene or something, you do a better job at it if you don't start talking about it. That's but if interesting. they ask you, what did the person look like? the suspected perpetrator or something like that? Yes. You do a worse job in a lineup, police lineup, than if you don't talk about it. And what that shows is that your subconscious processes of recognizing things, that you don't remember how you know it, but you know it. Just that feeling of familiarity, like you've seen the face before, Yes. that, that feeling decreases the more you talk about it consciously. 
So many processes work better when we don't think about them so much. It's not like they don't need some training too. But the real important message is we've put so much strength into the weight of the conscious mind. And yet we're finding now that the conscious mind, that whole system, while it's very strong in some areas, it's very weak in others. It's could, just limited at what it can do. Could we say that the conscious mind guards the gate of all it the rest guards, of the knowing? <laughs> it guards the gate of our ego systems. That's the thing. Okay. It definitely guards the gate. But Is it what, the dragon? <laughs> well, in a sense, it does. It's a very powerful thing, but if it's used in the wrong way, it's like taking a car on a, on a very fine tundra. You're trampling all the little plants under there, and those things need to exist there too. So it's a very powerful tool, but it needs to be used in the right way. We put so much weight in it, you know, in Western civilization that we uh, have lost sight of the more subtle processes. Okay, now, last question about this. In your professional and personal experience of living life and training people in remote viewing and being a remote viewer, can you assert at this time that the subconscious is the knower? We don't know that yet. Okay, okay. We really don't know who the knower is. Okay. That is the really big question. And you've heard a lot of other people talking about this. I don't who know that is, I have, but certainly it's an interesting yeah, question. Is, who is the perceiver? And that is really the big question. I mean, who, who's having conversations right here with each other? Who's doing this? You would think that it's this thing that you call you, right? <laughs> I think it's higher intelligence actually but directing this. <laughs> right. I mean, we don't know that this isn't the same person having a conversation with herself, himself, at the same time, that from one point of view seems like you're in your state and I'm in mine Yes. at a distance. And yet we don't really know because, and, and there's a lot of physiological experiments that have shown that we're not really sure where you make decisions either. It's not clear what part of the brain makes decisions if the brain is making it at all. You know, the neuromarketers say that the decisions are made in the ancient brain, the animal brain. That's very ancient. Do you agree with that? It's not true. Okay. It's not made in the brain. <laughs> I, this is this is the most amazing thing, Kim. Fabulous. I just read this article two days ago. They found <laughs> that your body affects your decisions and your thinking. That if you engage people in like rolling marbles upward on a table. Yes. And you look at their ability to recall positive stories and metaphors, they can do the positive stories faster than people rolling the marbles downward on a table. Those people are able to remember stories that have a downward theme and a negative emotional theme faster wow. than positive stories. It's called embodied cognition. That's and fascinating. Big, yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, it's turning the whole thing upside down. There's been a big debate in cognitive science whether thinking is something that happens in your brain or whether you have other people that argue that thinking is something that happens outside your body and your brain is just accessing it, right? That sounds more correct. Actually, yeah, what you just and said. then there's yeah, and then there's the idea that your body thinking's happening in your whole body. You've heard you know the whole mind body movement. Yeah. You know, I think it started with Candace Pert and many other people. The idea that your body thinks and it's not just your brain. We've been biased towards this idea that the thinking happens in the neuronal structure in your brain. And yet we know from the work of uh, Michael Gershon in his book, The Second Brain, I believe that there are more neurons in your intestinal Correct. digestive system. It's called the gut your... brain, right? Yeah. So yeah. where does the thinking happen? It's just, our, again, our own bias from our own upbringing, our civilization. It's not to its own fault, but we've been limited in how we think. The thinking happens in the whole body. And these studies show that the way you're holding yourself, left-handed people see things on the left differently than right-handed people emotionally that the thinking happens with the whole body. And then there's this idea that thinking happens outside your body and you're just kind of like a radio receiver for it, that it's happening in a, like a higher mind that we can't see and that we're just each tuned to a frequency in a sense that receives that information, transmits it. But we know we do have these bodies. So the bodies sort of modulate the thinking process too. Anyway, the whole point of this is it's not just something that happens in the brain. We've been too brain-centric. To, you know, to make our discussion a little bigger, we were talking about the subconscious a few minutes ago. Yes. These processes happen throughout our body, but, okay, I don't want to make this too complicated, but what is our body? 
I mean, this is why I wrote <laughs> Planetary Intelligence. Your body is the whole system you live in, including your planet and everything else like that, right? Yes. Because you think, well, my body ends right here at the edge of my skin, right? But you know it doesn't because you can't live for a couple minutes without oxygen, and you're not making any of that stuff. Who's making that? All the green guys around, you know? <laughs> so where does your body begin and where does it end? And so if you're thinking with your body, where does – what's your body? Well, your body is this whole – everything you see, it's, it's all of you. It's just this illusion of continuity that makes it seem placed in our – you know, in the space of our bodies over the span of a lifetime. It, what this all seems to show is that we're just not what we thought we were. And that's why we have all these resonant abilities, remote viewing, all these other things. That we're just t starting to touch the tip of the iceberg. It's not that it's amazing we have these abilities. It's just that, yeah, sure, we have these abilities because we are much bigger than we thought we were, our sense of who we are. And that's the real and fascinating thing about it, one of the fascinating things about the whole thing. I want to move to your naming time, temporal time rhythms, as one of the great obstructors of natural rhythms and temporal time obstructing the well-being of people around the world. You spend quite a bit of time on pages laying out this idea with different analogies and examples. You call it, I guess, distractions of the clock. How the clock and our preoccupation with machine time has, you didn't say ruined, but diminished the quality of life on Earth. Tremendously. Yeah, it's such a fascinating topic in itself, isn't it? We yeah. all feel time pressure now. It really has reduced the quality of life, and I guess you call it temporal imperialism. Yeah, it's really changed, even in the course of 10 years, how much we're expected to do now every day. I mean, to fit it all in, uh, because there's so much more inputs, inputs yes. in information, if you'd like to call that data, whatever you would like to call all the stuff we're engaged in all the time, you know. Uh, email and Twitter and social networking and all these other things that we is it real. It's not you can't just push it away. It's really part of our lives now for many of us, you know, and uh, the online world and so forth. But the downside of that is our bodies are designed the way as hunter gatherers, right? From hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? And its bodies are still working on this diurnal cycle of day and night. Bodies need to sleep, right? Right. They've had cases in Korea of kids playing video games nonstop for three or four days and then just falling over dead. And they passed a law in Korea making it illegal to play video games for more than a certain amount of time without taking a break. So this is what we're all up against in a sense is this technological world which is always on versus our own biological needs. I mean, you know that you can go for longer without food than you can without sleep. Yes. Yeah, so uh, scientists are still trying to decide out why we need sleep. Actually, no one's totally sure. There's a lot of theories. But we're built a certain way, and that doesn't change in 10 years just because we have the Internet now everywhere and our phones and everything. Our bodies are still like hunter-gatherers, and the way we perceive and the fight-or-flight response, the way we react to stress. And uh, so anyway, there are these different temporal systems, and if we don't get them to work cooperatively together, we'll have a lot of stress. Our bodies need time. The work we were talking about a few minutes ago by Guy Claxton, also you know that book by Malcolm Gladwell Blink? He talked about this also a lot, the writer for The New Yorker. Uh, it's another book about the subconscious, about uh, how it – what Malcolm Gladwell said in there, which relates to this, and, and Guy Claxton and others have all found, is – to make good decisions, you need what Gladwell calls white space. You know, it's space around the decision-making process. And Gladwell cites many examples of cases of police mistakes or brutality yeah. when real mistakes were committed because things just started happening to going too fast, right? And all of a sudden, guns come out, shots are fired, and... Once the shots are fired, lots of shots get fired because of kind of, it's just an autonomic reaction. And so Gladwell talks about white space. It's a situation we're all sort of in, in a sense, that when things happen too fast, we can show that your judgment declines. And just a, a real interesting example, apparently, according to Gladwell, a lot of communities are now requesting that police do not patrol in pairs, that you only have one officer per car because it slows things down. It's too easy when there are two policemen together.
for things to escalate very quickly and mistakes to be made. You know what? I agree with that. I think that's probably true. Don't you? Yes. It's something that I've experienced in my life just uh, with random traffic pullovers and things like that is they find if there's only one policeman there, he has to call for backup. He has to slow down. He has to go back to his car. He has to do things according to a certain procedure. And even if it's a slightly dangerous situation, it de-escalates things for a while. But um, if you have two policemen there or more, there's a certain culture of bravado that begins to build up and things happen much more quickly and mistakes are made. He cites the Amadou Diallo case in New York City, you know, where that unarmed immigrant was shot, you know, 44 times in just a few seconds and he Wild. had no weapon. Wow. It's, it's because the, the cops just reacted too quickly. They were in a bad neighborhood. Anyway, the whole point is that they didn't have the space they needed. They didn't slow down. Things escalated. But we're all in that kind of situation now where things can escalate very quickly. What it leads to is rudeness. You know, people not getting along as well in public spaces. Uh, certainly an example would just be cell phones where it's appropriate to talk in a certain way. This is a whole big discussion in itself. But it all has to do with time because the more things that get speeded up, it begins to impinge on older cultural systems and farther back biological systems about the way things were done. And it seems to me because things are changing so quickly now that we're all in kind of this really adaptive mode is how do we incorporate all of this stuff we do every day in a way that still allows us to have enough rest and enough time to make decisions in a good way. Because again, what the research shows is the more input you have, if you don't have time to process it properly, you don't think as well. And that's why Guy Claxton calls his book How Intelligence Increases When You Think Less. So, in other words, rather than have more information, which we have now, sometimes you need less information. Personally, I have rules about my own computer and cell phone use. After certain hours of the night, it all goes off. It all gets turned off. That's great. Because you need time for your subconscious like to digest what happened to you during the day. Do you want to evaluate what happened to you during the day? What, what did you like? What did you, you like? You know, to reassess, to ha have intent and vision for your next day, right? Well, if you just have all this information and you just go bang into, into sleep, right? You didn't have time to process it properly. And so that's just my belief about it at least. So we need to create systems that, you know, this technology is a wonderful thing, but we also need to have time with our family, with our friends, you know, with our lovers. Yeah. And that's often best without a lot of information technology around. Actually, I have a room that I don't allow cell phones in the bedroom anymore. Yeah, it's too many, even as an alarm clock, it's too much. It's just too much. It stays out of the bedroom because it's not the right mood. So it's, this is all has to do with time. I mean, we can go into it. It's, it's a long process. It's been happening over 100 years. But the bottom line is there's so much more possible because of this time control that we need to say, look, our bodies need rest, our emotions need space, and our subconscious processes need space too. So we need to have boundaries, healthy boundaries, to where technology is allowed and when we should turn it off. There's a, so many examples of this. I'll look at distracted driving, another example. Absolutely. How much can you do at once before you can't do things effectively? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about this river of intelligence, and then I want to go right into remote viewing and your work at the Institute. What we're talking about is all part of it, but I want to then zero in on that and bring it home to the listeners. You say we can fish from this river of intelligence anytime we want, and we can fish for intuitions, hunches, and gut feelings, and these fish can be very nutritious and healthy if we cook them properly. Now, Remote viewing is what for the public? Explain what remote viewing is. Remote viewing is your own ability to tap into non-local information, information from things that would physically appear to you to be at a distance so that the information could not be acquired through your physical senses of, uh, related to proximity, something being close to you. You're getting information in a way that is not connected to any uh, physical sense that we know about. And so it's happening through a non-local process. It's not happening through a direct uh, signal through your eyes or your ears and your other physical senses. And so the idea with that is to train people. It's not, now here's the thing, Kimmy, it's not like you need to learn how to do this. We all know how to do this. It's how to retrain yourself to listen to quiet signals. There's another part of this, too, that's really riveting to me, which is that when a remote viewer goes into this place to access non-local material, whatever it is, events, people, data, 
they can bypass time as we know it, temporal time, mm-hmm. meaning they can go back into the past, they can go into the present, or they can go into the future. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. That, for that to be correct, that means that matter as we know it is stored somewhere in the yes. universe. There is a storage of matter. All matter, all spoken words, all events, all experiences, all people, places, and things. Almost like a library. Could, right. could we say that? Isn't that a mind-blowing concept? Well, I've known about it for quite a while, and I try to explain this to clients. <laughs> Listen, if viewers can do this, and they've been doing it very convincingly, to see things in the near-term future, I think near, near-term because there's so many more possibilities the farther you go out in time, or see things in the past, it suggests that it's happening now somewhere. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, now. And there's no way you could pick up the information if it hasn't happened yet, right? Oh, uh, there's experiments we do with this uh, short-term predictions and things, stock market for fun, just to, sh- to see if we can do it, predict it the next day, and it works better than chance. All the studies seem to show this, 60 to 80 percent accurate. But viewers found they could view things even back at SRI in the early days, Stanford Research Institute, before the person even got to the site where they were going to stand and just look around. The viewer back at the lab could already describe where they were going to go. Well, the the what it seems to suggest is that these things are already happening somewhere. It, it's just almost hard to comprehend because our conscious minds like to believe, you know, there's a past and a present and a future, but RV suggests that it isn't, if it's true. Well, it's, it's pretty important stuff. It's an entire revolution as we know it in what time is. It also, to me, bypasses all belief structures about time, totally blows it open, and therefore... The future that people are hooked into and the past that they're suffering about, it's stored already. It's almost like it's already all done. You could go as far as to say this conversation has been had already. This show has been had already. It's already recorded somewhere and we're interfacing and what we're understanding is the here and the now with it. The question is then really who the heck are we? What are we? Well, that's the thing, Kim. There's the rub. (laughs) (laughs) And what's really going on? We're choosing. We're choosing every second which path to go down. Because, and listen, every all the science magazines have talked about this recently. Parallel realities. It's not just an abstract concept anymore. There is different versions of everything happening all at the same time, and you're perceiving a slice of it. So it's a question of which slice do you want to perceive. And I'm not talking in a Pollyannish sense, you know. Yes, I understand. Where I know we're all ultimately responsible for the reality you create, but you're not to blame for what happens to you either. But it does mean that there are different versions of reality. And you seem to pick up the one that you're resonating at <laughs> because there are different versions of it. So, yes, all these things are already there, but which one are you going to perceive? There's different. There's different versions of the earth. You know, all these negative uh, versions we hear, future predictions of doom and gloom and all that. Yeah, which I don't That's, agree with, by the way. I don't buy it. Yeah, those are, those are one version of what could happen. And in some parallel reality, they're happening. But that doesn't mean that's the one you and I are going to experience or the listeners of our show. Right. Because we're in another version. I, we can't see this happening, and it's almost impossible to prove that it works this way. But there's certainly a lot of speculation in Scientific American, New Scientist, even Science Magazine, that the way physics suggests the universe works, the most modern physics that we know about, suggests that there's other versions of things. Look at the idea of dark matter and dark energy. This is what physicists try to use to explain why there's more gravity around than there should be at interstellar distances. It suggests that we can't see 96% of what's around us right here, right now. There's other versions of, there's more stuff around us. You can't see it. You can't even interact with it. Is this why you mentioned Flatland as an example of how, is it the movie or the book, Flatland? It's both. It's a movie. Okay. There's a movie version out of it. It's really fun. It's an animated, I really loved it. It's an animated short. And And uh, its purpose is what? To show that we don't really know what reality is. Yeah, it's like there is a higher dimensional reality that impinges on our 3D world. And uh, there was a great article in New Scientist a couple of weeks ago about this. 
just like in your credit card, there's a two dim- there's a hologram of a little bird or something. Yes. It's a 3D image embedded on a two-dimensional surface, right? But it can look kind of 3D, but you know your credit card is really kind of like, technically like a two-dimensional surface. The hologram is just a flat thing, but it projects 3D. Well, in the same way in our 3D world, fourth-dimensional processes impinge onto our 3D surface. If we're living in Flatland and we're on that credit card, we wouldn't know what was going on outside the credit card, these people using the credit card. We would just live on that card, and occasionally we would get stuck into a cash machine or something or a credit card reader. <laughs> we wouldn't know what that was because we lived on the surface of the two-dimensional surface. Yeah. Well, in the same way, in our 3D world, there are things that happen that we can't explain, just like the inhabitants of a two-dimensional world can't explain it when something comes down from above. There's no concept of above and below in a, two, in a two-dimensional world. And in a three-dimensional world, there's no concept of really anything but the present. And so that's what Flatland, you know, was written like in 1884 or something. And Edwin Abbott, he really, it was a great idea because the whole point of the book is it's really funny is that the guy gets arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment because he believes in higher dimensions. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it was a comment on Victorian England. He, be, he gets visited by a sphere. And they say they know these things exist, the elite of Flatland, but they don't want anybody to know because it would disturb the social order. So they they try him. (laughs) And they all know it's real, but they say we can't let the public know. This is in 1884. And so we all kind of live in this flat. We know there's more than our, our conventional science or media or officials in our society say is true. But they don't want it to be true because it disturbs the status quo too much. And yet we're having these experiences just like the inhabitants of Flatland experienced spheres. We're experiencing things like what? UFOs, apparitions, ghosts. Oh, just you name it. This is all explainable from a 4D, 5D level impinging on a 3D surface. If you think about it that way, it's not so outlandish that way at all. That things could just pop in and pop out. But from a 3D perspective, it is. Anyway, that's what Flatland's all about, and it's certainly a, it's worth reading because even now you read it, and it's so funny. Or take, take a look at the movie. Actually, I was told to look at the movie just a little while ago, reading your book. I love that it was mentioned there. It's like, okay, I it's have, time for me I to have, see that. You know, I have a post about it on my blog from Where? a couple of days ago. What's the URL? Uh, it's crystalbluemind.com. Fabulous. And I have a post going... Two or three days back, Flatlander, you to search for it, and there's a, a link through to it. Uh, it was featured in Spiritual Cinema Circle a couple months ago. Okay. And as one of their featured films, you know, they have four every month. Right. And I wrote a little thing about it because that's how I found out about it. Is I didn't, you know, it's not, it wasn't in my movie theaters. It's also, you can see clips on YouTube, and you can go to their website, the flatlandthemovie.com. No, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, movie, and the ideas are still really valuable and, and useful. And that's why I kind of, you know, in Opening Minds, I kind of talked about it at the beginning. It's just a good uh, metaphor for where we're at right now. You make a distinction between remote viewing and resonant viewing. Why? And explain it to the public, please. Well, you know, it's actually a very important point, Kim, because if remote viewing works, it implies that there isn't anything that's really remote, right? <laughs> Correct. Because it's remote from the sense of three dimensions, but if we can connect with distant objects, people, and events, and get information from them or even communicate, like uh, some experiments have attempted to do, then they're not really remote, are they? Otherwise, you wouldn't be communicating with them. So it really suggests that there's a type of resonant connection, like we were talking about you know, in the beginning of the show, like radio waves, radio frequencies, and you're selecting the channel you want to perceive on. It's more that everything's connected all the time, you're just choosing which channels you choose to perceive in, in a variety of ways. So remote viewing was a cool term they came up with to get funding for it back when they were getting the interest of the intelligence and military communities. Yes. But I don't think scientifically it's the most accurate way to describe it because it's coming from a 3D perspective. The whole idea of remoteness is a 3D idea. It's a mechanistic idea. Let's talk about something in remote viewing. You train people to go in and bypass space and time to access people, events, situations that have been in the past, are happening in the present, or will happen in what we understand to be our future. 
what happens when this portal opens up in your students and now they can access, could I say, other universes of phenomenon, other parallel paths of phenomenon? What happens to students who now have this portal open and how do you distinguish remote viewing from what people would say, oh, that's just being a psychic. That's just psychic phenomenon. I know I asked you two questions, but whichever yes, you one did. you can. Did okay. you? <laughs> yeah, I did. Sorry about that. To go answer the first one, Please. let's go with the second one first. You know, remote viewers, quote unquote, distinguish themselves just from the whole concept of psychic in the sense that there's a structured system with a set of stages or phases, if you would like, that proceeds in a certain way when people are being trained. It's what the, you know, the Stanford Research Institute and the military came up with for a way that was training anyone to be able to do this. Um, and, and a psychic process is generally a little more unstructured, but I don't want to say that in a, in a negative way. They're really all tapping into the same process. It's just the methodology is different. Uh, a psychic could go about accessing information in any untold number of ways, even ways they can't describe to us. A remote viewer has a way of describing it in a sense. It was designed for that because it was designed to be used within a, you know, a government military system. So it's just a different methodology in my view, but the underlying processes in nature that make it possible are probably pretty much the same thing. There's also the issue of verifiability and so forth. I was going to say that, that, that. Remote viewers like to always point out how they use do verifiable targets, but they don't always do this. People view all sorts of targets all the time that can't be verified until later or maybe not at all. But that's a good, important point and certainly in training is to be able to verify that this is corresponding to the reality we can see in front of us if you're viewing this reality, right? Isn't that the so, protocol that also distinguishes it? It's the series of protocols that distinguish... Yes, there is feedback at the end of a, of a resonant viewing, remote viewing session um, that allows the viewer to see exactly what they were viewing, right? So they can calibrate their system. And often um, psychics may not have that type of feedback available to them. Um, if they're working with the police or other situations, maybe you don't ever get the feedback because a case may never be solved, whatever. So there's a variety of dif differences in the approach. The, the RV process is really designed to give feedback to the viewers so they learn as much as possible about themselves, you know, when they're done. Can't they get better? Is it like enhancing a muscle, if you will, like an exercise? Yes. I, there is debate about this in the viewing community. I, obviously, I wouldn't be someone that teaches this to people if I didn't believe they could relearn or remember how to do this. And I think it's, it's a lot of different processes. It's learning to uh, reduce the amount of noise in your mind so that the signal is just louder because there's less noise, less chatter. But it is the analogy of a muscle is, is pretty good. I mean, it's there. You just need to exercise it again. It's like a limb that fell asleep. So it's kind of partly built in. and It's partly you need to remember that it's there and get comfortable with the way that the information feels because it doesn't feel the same as conscious information. So that is kind of a difference between you know, psychic, the idea of a psychic and idea of remote viewer, it's the methodology that's very different, even if the underlying processes still use the same sort of wh whatever it is, quantum or electro, magna, etheric energies, whatever it is, it's a different methodology. But to go to your first question, you, you can access a lot, but you never access really more than you're ready for because it just, you're accessing more of yourself in a sense when you do viewing. And that is going to open up, the subconscious mind, in my view, is going to open up as it feels comfortable in doing. So right, technically, right. you could access everything and anything, but we all still live here, you know, as embodied earth beings here with certain things that are important to us every day and things we need to pay attention to. So for many of us, we're never just going to be able to completely wander away from ourselves because we all have responsibilities and things that we have to do here to keep going every day. And so... You can take a little break from that for a while, but the portal does open up. It definitely does open up, and it opens up to people in very interesting ways. I, I can't tell you how many times I've given people that targets the things that we view as practice hidden in a folder that just looked to me like a regular object that made them burst into tears or something because it reminded them of something they hadn't thought about in a long time. In many cases a UFO related encounter that they had never they forgot about that they had when they were a kid round objects often remind people of flying saucers and people remember things that happened to them that they haven't remembered in a long time or things that just felt scary you know uh, because it has that association so 
just to use that as an example, it does open people up to themselves, and often that can be repressed memories. And once you go beyond that level of repressed memories, you begin to open up to kind of a broader range of, of information, and, and you can just perceive a lot more and write it down before your conscious mind tries to take control again and shut it off. So it's a gradual, like an aperture opening up. I, I've never seen it just go, well, I, you know, I have seen a couple cases where people really flipped into a different state even started channeling as a result of RV, but that's pretty rare. Pretty, pretty rare. It hasn't happened very often. I also thought it was interesting that in remote viewing, you can actually access things at a distance and you can see, if you have to see, in targets that are underwater, it doesn't matter. It's not limited to the electromagnetic spectrum. You can go that's into right. subspace, which I think is fascinating, and you can go outside of what's happening on the Earth. It's so vast what it can do. Why do people want to learn RV? What do you think is motivating people to come learn at your institute and other institutes? And how does it enhance the lives of people who are learning? Well, you know, Kim, I can tell you the interest in this is growing daily. Um, the best, easiest measure for me is my own YouTube videos. When I first put them up, there were maybe 10, 20, 30 views a day. Now it's up to 1,000 people a day are looking at those remote viewing videos. And that just shows me that there's increased interest in this. People are getting very curious. I suspect what it is is that people just know they have these abilities and we're reaching a time on the planet where we're encountering a lot, encountering a lot of scarcity at the physical economic level. Yes. I think it makes people naturally want to know what else is there that I can trust. What else is there that I can rely on as the external world becomes increasingly chaotic, so to speak, disorderly, almost hard to make sense of what it's doing, uh, not easy to define? The natural thing for us to do is, well, what else is there that I can trust and believe in and that I know is there? And what it is, is it's yourself. It's aspects of yourself that you didn't know you have. It just seems to me almost like a natural response to if there was a watering hole and all the animals on the savanna were going to this water hole and it started to dry up, what would they do? They would eventually start looking for another watering hole. And what we're doing now is shifting to a higher dimensional watering hole. Because that's a great example. Life. That's a great example. Keep going. It feels that is like excellent. That. It, it feels like that to me. I can see the interest in this growing daily. It's amazing. And it's not because I'm promoting it or any animals I know in the RV community. We're all just doing everything because we like it. We enjoy working with very small groups of people, even one at a time. It's fun just to work with one person. You don't need a lot of people to make this work. But there's increased interest, a lot of demand, because people are saying, well, the existing system isn't feeding me so well anymore. I can't trust my government necessarily. I can't trust the banks that seem to be like such good friends for all those years, right? I can't trust these organizations. I can't trust... Who knows? The people that run the oil wells out in the Gulf. Well, who else? What else is there that's solid that I can believe in? And so people are naturally curious in these other um, processes which have been around for thousands of years, but we haven't really needed to explore because we're being well fed by, in a lot of ways, you know, well fed by the existing system. And as the existing system seems to really be tottering this 3D version of the world, the mechanistic paradigm. People just are curious, what else is there? So when they see other things that have a lot of scientific evidence backing them up, have a history, and something that's trainable and learnable, I think they just naturally want to take a look and see, well, what else, what else could I be doing with my own life and myself, and what else other abilities do I have that maybe I never even knew I had? How long are your classes, by the way? We're doing this online now. Uh, I just started this a couple months ago. It's called Virtual Viewing. Wow. Wow virtualviewing.info is my new site to teach people online because I'll tell you, Kim, people want to, how can I learn to do this? And I realized, you know what? I can't make them all come to Boulder, Colorado from all over the world. I need to come to them. That's so great. So after years of resisting this because I thought you couldn't do it online because you needed someone there, I created a series of like 40 videos about how to do this. It just took me six months to complete. I'm still working on it, but it's just about finished. And people That's have been great. signing up. I've had a few people go through just to see how it works and so forth. And they've really enjoyed it. I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I, it was like a test run. They said, I really enjoy this. They like it. And, and uh, you know, we do stuff online sometimes. And 
So it, it's at virtualviewing.info, and uh, that is the page where you can sign up, and, or virtualviewing.org is a kind of description of it. And basically, it allows people... We do still do the three-day classes here in Boulder. How much do they cost right now? I'm just curious. Three-day classes in Boulder when uh, people are physically is, there. We do that. It's at, like at nine ninety five. Okay. But it's much more cost-effective for people to do it at home. I have the basic class. I'm not trying to sell this here, but just... No, no, I understand. You asked. Uh, I have a basic class for three ninety seven online. And it all comes with... A, a three-day guarantee. I mean, honestly, if people take this, I'm totally serious. And they didn't. Get, it's not life-changing for them. I don't want their money. I only want it if they said this is at worth every penny. So I have the basic class, and people can do it at home. And you know what they tell me? They like it. I mean, this is a kind of discovery for me. We've been talking about time and all this. Sure. People like things that they can break up into bits of time. When they have 20 minutes or half an hour, they can do one of the sessions, the viewing practice sessions that I put online for them. Is this kind of a new paradigm in the way that it's taught? I know that it there is. are some practitioners that, you know, deliver their trainings on DVDs and all that, and you're delivering it virtually through the Internet as well and in person. I, but I think yeah, it's interesting. It's online, and we do it over Skype. I have a mentoring program, too, that is a bit more expensive where we do sessions online over Skype so I can see what they're drawing, give them feedback immediately and so forth, like we're talking now. Yeah. Yes, I mean... Kim, I had to do this because technology had changed. I like classes like we all do where we get together in a seminar for three days. Yes. Well, it's very complicated nowadays. You have to go through airplanes. You have to go through security. It's gotten much more complicated. You have and to be radiated thought, at the airports. <laughs> yes. I had that happen to me a couple of weeks ago. I had to go through. There was a mistake in the system, and they every, like every third single male was getting irradiated. They, the guys to apologize. I said it was a mistake in the airline's t- queuing system, but... Yeah, we, it's very annoying, right? It's time-consuming. And people don't have three days anymore where they can just spend as easily as they used to, maybe. So I, I did this thing online, and people can communicate by phone. We do it Skype, email, and we create a virtual class. And then so sometimes I do a thing over Ustream. Yes. You know, .TV. Yes. And I can broadcast to them, or we can have a conference call so we can retain that group feeling. But it's very interesting because people work at different levels. But maybe that's the way it should be. They don't have the advantage of seeing other people in the group immediately, the results other people are getting, which is a very powerful thing. Yes. So I need to find a way to work on that. But it does give people that are disciplined enough to do this, hey, they got a few minutes, let's do a viewing session. I put, the, I put a new one up every week, a new target for people to practice, right? And so they try it on their own time. They write back to me what they got. And even for people, listen, for people that say, I can't afford it, I have a lot of them for free on YouTube anyway because – people need to learn even if they don't have the ability to pay for it right now so and the last question i want to ask you of the many million i will have (laughs) so that we don't take the public into a too long-winded show but it's certainly fascinating and that is i'd like to know your take on free will now let me preface this question if in fact it has been proven through remote viewing slash remote sensing that time is not what we think, that the present, the past, and the future are all happening now, but in different dimensions. It invokes the question in me, do we really have the free will we think we do, or are we born with this free will ability in the moment, every moment, but in fact, it's not really free will, it's the illusion of free will? Well, I without copying out on your question it's a bit of both okay the it's a very good question thank you because <laughs> we keep really me around don't. keep me around <laughs> yeah i will you're asking the right questions yeah been on a mission 25 years one thing i do is i ask the questions <laughs> you do don't you <laughs> you have a tiger Tim. by the tail quick run <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> we, we don't know who's making the decisions anymore we were talking earlier about the role of the subconscious. Yes. There is something called the Libet response. Benjamin Libet discovered this 10 or 20 years ago. Before you actually make a decision and you're aware that you've made a decision, there's a pulse in your brain. Originally, they thought it was just like 100 milliseconds before. Now it's up to even a half a second or a full second before you think you are doing something. There's a reaction in your brain. 
one right. interpretation of this is the decision's been made before you thought you made it. I totally remember this. This is so great. Talk a little bit more about this because I think we need to really hear this. Yes, we don't know who's making the decisions because it seems like you've made a commitment to your interpretation of reality before you even know you're making it. Uh, a lot of research in physiology, brain physiology, has shown that the way you respond to certain things depends on the emotional content, which means before you're even aware of your interpretation of something, something in your subconscious has made a commitment one way or another. I think uh, Deepak Chopra called it a premature cognitive commitment. That was his term for it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But it's this idea that you subconsciously make choices, but if it's happening subconscious, who's doing it? Because you're not consciously sitting there. You think you, re you go on to, into the supermarket, you choose between different types of cereal. You know, you think you're making a choice. But this research seems to indicate you already made the choice. And you're rationalizing the decision rather than actually making a choice. This turns all that rational choice theory on its head, by the way. <laughs> okay, to, get, to get deeper into your question, who's, if, if we're not making decisions the way we are making it, what's really, what are we doing <laughs> We're certainly making decisions at a subconscious level, and since it still originates from you, you're responsible. But more importantly, I think what we choose to dwell on at every moment is our responsibility. I agree with you. We do seem to have the ability to shift what we're focusing on. And in that sense, you can change. I think the research shows that if you hold on to a thought for 15 seconds or longer, it begins to have a physiological impact on you in the way that the dendrites are structured in your, uh, your nervous system. You wow. begin to grow dendrites around your thoughts. Every thought has a physical uh, manifestation. Mm -hmm. Yes, in your body. So we are responsible for what we choose to dwell on. Yes. And so in a sense, I, still, I think we do have free will, but I can't prove that ultimately. Yeah. It's just my experience of it. I don't think any of us ultimately can, sure. but I think we do because we do have a choice of our focus from moment Correct. to moment. That's where I think the free will is. But I'm yeah. just wondering if the total sense of free will is inflated and that a great part of it is an illusion. We have a part like what you're talking about, about what we focus on. Let me give you an interesting example of this. I just got an email for someone this morning that heard a show that I did on extraterrestrial civilizations. And the particular guest had mentioned something politically that was very accusatory to the country of Israel and the United States. And when we got to that part of the interview, as the person who's having the dialogue with the guest, I chose with consciousness not to engage in a battle or a fight or a retort about that comment because that was not the focus of the show. I did not agree with the statement that was made. So somebody had listened to the show that heard about it from Facebook, and I must have read an entire page of litany about how I was doing soft journalism. It was a very perceptive comment the guy made that my silence and not dealing with that comment was basically giving license to it and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. And I said, look, at the end of the day, my guests are my guests. I'm not there to attack them for the way they think or what they feel. There will be some things I will respond to, but I'm here to move the conversation and to expand the public mind and consciousness of what's going on. And so just because a guest says something that I don't politically agree with doesn't mean I'm going to then get into a political discussion with them. It took great, it's interesting, you never know how things are being responded to by people, but it took great restraint for me not to respond to the statement that my guest made. But I did it with consciousness to keep the energy moving because I had to make a higher choice to expand the public thought and work with him on the show to do that or to get into a battle over something that the show wasn't about. It's interesting, though, as a producer and host, that I got the response I did. But it's just, I'm bringing this home to say to you that that choice was made during the interview and with consciousness, even though I personally didn't like it, didn't like what was said, didn't agree with it, etc. And that's where free will comes into being. I exercise my free will not to get into a tangle 
which doesn't mean that I resist conflict. I just didn't see it as carrying what the show was about forward. That's free will. Now, I told the gentleman who made the comment, feel free to make the comment on the broadcast blog. And if you would like to have me have that guest back and you'd like to be one of the callers to ask him questions or to get into a response to that, that can be a separate segment. No problem. Do you see what I'm saying? And I don't have to accept that it's soft journalism because I didn't get into a fight with my guest, but that's free will. Maybe another host would get into it and try through ratings to get into a conflict. I think that's inappropriate. It's not about whether I personally agree with what they're saying, but they need to reveal what they think, what they feel, what their experience, what their expertise is, et cetera. You know, I did also a show with George Gilder on the Israel test. So I've had both good and bad things said about Israel, about Jewish people, about this and that. And I don't take on everything that people say politically. I just don't go there because that's not what my show's about. But I wanted to share that with you that right. that's an I example that's of free will a, in action. Yeah, I think you made a choice. You made a choice to have a type of show that can cover a lot of types of topics without making judgment. Because people are used to this type of journalism now that is kind of like gutter journalism, where it just turns into like a food fight. We all see this. I mean, we know channels on TV that are like this now. It's sure. very narrow. And people, look, honestly, people like that in some ways, that type of argumentative type of attacking type of journalism because it's like a gladiator duel. You know, someone's going to get injured. It's like, where's the blood, right? Well, there's a lot of things that I don't have to agree with, with people's views. The thing was also the conscious choice of my free will to be a player in moving the subject of the interview, the main body of subject, opening it up for the public mind. That was my choice versus getting into my personal issue with what the guest said. You made a choice, and you made a choice to have a show that can stay open rather than to go to a lower level where it's all just about attacking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people, again, people have gotten used to that now because of the type of cable channels we have. But it doesn't often help because it just becomes a very narrow argument. And so if you've made a choice not to have that, it makes your show more expansive and more open to new possibilities. But Otherwise, it doesn't necessarily fit if you're very tuned in to the frequency of political dialogue, fighting, conflict, right. attacking different views, etc. It's more in the dwelling place where you dwell. And I have people on that have said statements, even people I have huge respect for, etc., that I really think some of the things they have said in the body of their higher contribution didn't enhance the expandability of their main contribution that were off-putting or that didn't apply. It's not for me to say. If they call me as a media coach, I'll assist them. <laughs> but it's not for me to be doing that in the interview. But I want to go back to your book as we close, and hopefully you will come back and be a guest again. I've really oh, enjoyed sure. this. I want to go back to Opening Minds as you subtitled it, A Journey of Extraordinary Encounters, Crop Circles, and Resonance. I would like in the last few minutes, if you can, and this subject deserves a whole other hour and a half, really, what is a crop circle? Give us the frame of reference, then share with us what are the distortions or the multiple things about this subject that we need to know about that moved you to write about it. So what is a crop circle? Well, it's uh, obviously a whole nother show, Kim. <laughs> but yeah, just to give them some food no, for no, thought, no, and then no, we'll no, have you yeah, back. It's, it's these patterns that appear in grain crops for the last hundred years or more in a lot of different countries. Some of them are made by UFOs. Some of them are made by balls of light. Uh, a lot of them are now made by people. They all seem to have very strange effects on cameras and batteries and attract a lot of weirdness around them. I can say this from firsthand uh, knowledge. It, I've seen it happen so many times myself. Even in circles that we've made experimentally, I know this is a kind of a taboo subject for some people in the crop circle. We've made some to see what it's like, and we've gotten the weird effects in our cameras and equipment in the ones we've made, which means they're all real all of them from different sources of origin. And so what we seem to have created is a type of advanced technology out in the field. It's possible, I mean, my interpretation is that the UFO and occupants were, have been attempting to show us something and that the whole goal was to get people to experiment with it, to play with it. But, you know, the reason why it works goes back to what we we're talking about, chaos theory a little bit. It's like a coherent distortion in the field of perfectly planted wheat, you know, planted very evenly, regularly. And then you have this geometric pattern. It's like a distortion in this very regular distribution of wheat or whatever grain crop it is. 
seems to create very interesting electronic and other types of effects that we can't easily explain right now. So it's almost like one of these four-dimensional technologies that's talking about four dimensions. It's very weird, the types of things you see around crop circles, and it's not easy to explain. I think people have been a little too quick to judge exactly what it is and decide which are the real ones and which aren't and so forth. I don't see there being hoaxes. I mean, maybe now and then people try to do it just to fool people, but they have a real energy to them, even man-made ones. And if you want to come on our crop circle tour Talk in about that. July, August, you know, we take people out there. They can see this for themselves. Don't take my word for it. Uh, we have a tour in end of July and then July through August. We're full on the first one. So the second week is now open July 27th through August 3rd. We'd love to have people come along. We go out to Wiltshire. We have, we're with uh, Colin Andrews, who's a, a very well-known crop circle researcher. He's been doing this a long time. We spend a lot of time at the sacred sites learning to feel energy, perceive energy of the sacred sites and the crop circles. And almost every year, obviously, I can't guarantee it, people have weird experiences with their cameras or other equipment while we're there. It even happened to us last summer. Cameras stop working. They do weird things. There's weird things on the film. Um, there's some energy out there that interacts with us in a very weird way, and it's a lot of fun to be around. Apart from all the UFO sightings, balls of light, and other things that seem to be attracted to crop formations, um, it's just, you know, Kim, it's one of the strangest things I've ever encountered in my life. I mean, the reason I called it a journey of extraordinary encounters is you think by a certain age, you kind of know how the world works. At least if you're in graduate school, there's a little bit of arrogance there, I guess. And you get your PhD and you think, I know how things are, right? And then you do something like this. You go to a UFO conference, you hear someone talk about a crop circle tour, you take a remote viewing class, throws your world upside down because you all, all of a sudden start encountering phenomena you can't explain with your conventional methodology you learned in graduate school or like science, basically what the science community has taught you. And so you have a choice. You could either say that's not real, it's pseudo science, it's paranormal, it's you just uh, yak like a not even like a skeptic. Yeah, you're scoffing at it. You know what I'm saying? Pushing yes. it away. I don't want to deal with that. It's it's hoaxes. Or you could honestly say, what is going on? And you could do a little investigation, a little preliminary study type, is there something going on here or not? You know, in the cases of remote viewing and crop circles, obviously UFOs, ET contact, there's a lot of evidence for it. You may not want to look at the evidence. Crop circles are a perfect example. I went there with an open mind in 1997 with Ron Russell on his crop circle tour, you know, and I didn't know what to expect. And I saw people were telling me, look, I just came out of this crop circle. My camera's not working anymore. Or I, we, had, we had a UFO sighting there last night. And this happened a lot. And I eventually began experiencing it myself, not the first year, but after coming back, cameras, weird stuff, my own UFO sightings. And I went there just, I could have been anything. I could have walked away from it, but I saw something was really going on. And so when you do that, it's not easy to turn back and just go back with the paradigm you had before. It's shifted. There's obviously something going on. It makes it exciting and uh, uh, scary and all, all at once, all those things, because you don't know what you're dealing with anymore. But that's the edge of science. That's the cutting edge of science. And that's where you really owe it to, to yourself and everyone else to be. I mean, society didn't spend all these years for you to be in graduate training just to do what everyone else did and just to play it safe. You have to go out at the edge and find out what's going on at the edge of the village that no one <clears throat> ever wanted to talk about. I want to close this segment with you by saying that in your section on synchronicity under time in your book, Opening Minds, you say that the universe has an order and is orchestrated by unseen intelligence. Simeon Hine, I want to thank you for being a guest on It's Rainmaking Time. I would love to invite you back with others and to talk more about your life experience and your teaching Simeon Hine is the founder of the Mount Baldy Institute of Resonance, and he can be located. Where are you located at your URL? Oh, you can just go to my blog, crystalbluemind.com, and, and you can get links to the virtual viewing class. I'd love to have work with more people on that. Crop Circle Tour, I'd love to have more people come along with us and see it. It's all open for people to participate in. So, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. Thank you, Simeon, for being a guest Please go to www.itsrainmakingtime.com. Comment, share shows that you like and don't like with your friends. <laughs> We're not afraid of controversy. And thank you so much for being a guest today. God bless you.